On the Road, a short story by Anton Chekhov. Upon the breast of a gigantic crag, a golden cloudlet rested for one night. Lermontov. In the room which the tavern keeper, the Cossack Semyon Chistopluy, called the Traveller's Room, that is kept exclusively for travellers, a tall, broad-shouldered man of forty was sitting at the big, unpainted table. He was asleep with his elbows on the table and his head leaning on his fist. An end of tallow candle stuck into an old pomatum pot lighted up his light brown beard, his thick, broad nose, his sunburnt cheeks, and the thick, black eyebrows overhanging his closed eyes. The nose and the cheeks and the eyebrows, all the features, each taken separately, were coarse and heavy, like the furniture and the stove in the traveller's room. But taken all together, they gave the effect of something harmonious and even beautiful. Such is the lucky star, as it is called, of the Russian face. The coarser and harsher its features, the softer and more good-natured it looks. The man was dressed in a gentleman's reefer jacket, shabby, but bound with wide new braid, a plush waistcoat, and full black trousers thrust into big high boots. On one of the benches, which stood in a continuous row along the wall, a girl of eight, in a brown dress and long black stockings, lay asleep on a coat lined with fox. Her face was pale, her hair was flaxen, her shoulders were narrow, her whole body was thin and frail, but her nose stood out as thick and ugly a lump as the man's. She was sound asleep and unconscious that her semicircular comb had fallen off her head and was cutting her cheek. The traveller's room had a festive appearance. The air was full of the smell of freshly scrubbed floors. There were no rags hanging as usual on the line that ran diagonally across the room, and a little lamp was burning in the corner over the table, casting a patch of red light on the icon of St. George the Victorious. From the icon stretched on each side of the corner a row of cheap oleographs, which maintained a strict and careful gradation in the transition from the sacred to the profane. In the dim light of the candle end and the red icon lamp, the pictures looked like one continuous stripe, covered with blurs of black. When the tiled stove, trying to sing in unison with the weather, drew in the air with a howl, while the logs, as though waking up, burst into bright flame and hissed angrily, red patches began dancing on the log walls, and over the head of the sleeping man could be seen first the elder seraphim, then the Shah Nasir ed Din, then a fat brown baby with goggle eyes, whispering in the ear of a young girl with an extraordinarily blank and indifferent face. Outside, a storm was raging. Something frantic and wrathful, but profoundly unhappy, seemed to be flinging itself about the tavern with the ferocity of a wild beast and trying to break in banging at the doors, knocking at the windows and on the roof, scratching at the walls, it alternately threatened and besought, then subsided for a brief interval, and then with a gleeful, treacherous howl burst into the chimney. But the wood flared up, and the fire, like a chained dog, flew wrathfully to meet its foe. A battle began, and after its sobs, shrieks, howls of wrath. In all of this, there was the sound of angry misery and unsatisfied hate, and the mortified impatience of something accustomed to triumph. Bewitched by this wild, inhuman music, the traveller's room seemed spellbound forever, but all at once the door creaked and the potboy, in a new print shirt, came in. Limping on one leg and blinking his sleepy eyes, he snuffed the candle with his fingers, put some more wood on the fire, and went out. At once from the church, which was three hundred paces from the tavern, the clock struck midnight. The wind played with the chimes as with the snowflakes. Chasing the sounds of the clock, it whirled them round and round over a vast space, so that some strokes were cut short or drawn out in long, vibrating notes, while others were completely lost in the general uproar. One stroke sounded as distinctly in the room as though it had chimed just under the window. The child, sleeping on the fox skin, started and raised her head. For a minute she stared blankly at the dark window, 
at Nasir ed-Din, over whom a crimson glow from the fire flickered at that moment. Then she turned her eyes upon the sleeping man. Daddy, she said. But the man did not move. The little girl knitted her brow angrily, lay down, and curled up her legs. Someone in the tavern gave a loud, prolonged yawn. Soon afterwards, there was the squeak of the swing door and the sound of indistinct voices. Someone came in, shaking the snow off and stamping in felt boots which made a muffled thud. What is it? a woman's voice asked languidly. Mademoiselle Ilovaisky has come, answered a bass voice. Again there was the squeak of the swing door. Then came the roar of the wind rushing in. Someone, probably the lame boy, ran to the door leading to the traveller's room, coughed deferentially and lifted the latch. This way, lady, please, said a woman's voice in dulcet tones. It's clean in here, my beauty. The door was opened wide, and a peasant with a beard appeared in the doorway, in the long coat of a coachman, plastered all over with snow from head to foot, and carrying a big trunk on his shoulder. He was followed into the room by a feminine figure, scarcely half his height, with no face and no arms, muffled and wrapped up like a bundle, and also covered with snow. A damp chill, as from a cellar, seemed to come to the child from the coachman and the bundle, and the fire and the candles flickered. What nonsense, said the bundle angrily. We could go perfectly well. We have only nine more miles to go, mostly by the forest, and we should not get lost. As for getting lost, we shouldn't, but the horses can't go on, lady, answered the coachman. And it is thy will, O Lord, as though I had done it on purpose. God knows where you have brought me. Well, be quiet. There are people asleep here, it seems. You can go. The coachman put the portmanteau on the floor, and as he did so, a great lump of snow fell off his shoulders. He gave a sniff and went out. Then the little girl saw two little hands come out from the middle of the bundle, stretch upwards, and begin angrily disentangling the network of shawls, kerchiefs, and scarves. First, a big shawl fell on the ground, then a hood, then a white knitted kerchief. After freeing her head, the traveller took off her pelisse and at once shrank to half the size. Now she was in a long grey coat with big buttons and bulging pockets. From one pocket she pulled out a paper parcel, from the other a bunch of big heavy keys, which she put down so carelessly that the sleeping man started and opened his eyes. For some time he looked blankly round him, as though he didn't know where he was. Then he shook his head, went to the corner, and sat down. The newcomer took off her great coat, which made her shrink to half her size again. She took off her big felt boots and sat down too. By now she no longer resembled a bundle. She was a thin little brunette of twenty, as slim as a snake, with a long white face and curly hair. Her nose was long and sharp, her chin, too, was long and sharp, her eyelashes were long, the corners of her mouth were sharp, and thanks to this general sharpness, the expression of her face was biting. Swathed in a closely fitting black dress with a mass of lace at her neck and sleeves, with sharp elbows and long pink fingers, she recalled the portraits of medieval English ladies. The grave concentration of her face increased this likeness. The lady looked round at the room, glanced sideways at the man and the little girl, shrugged her shoulders and moved to the window. The dark windows were shaking from the damp west wind. Big flakes of snow glistening in their whiteness lay on the window frame, but at once disappeared, borne away by the wind. The savage music grew louder and louder. After a long silence, the little girl suddenly turned over and said angrily, emphasizing each word, Oh, goodness, goodness, how unhappy I am, unhappier than anyone. The man got up and moved with little steps to the child with a guilty air, which was utterly out of keeping with his huge figure and big beard. You are not asleep, dearie, he said, in an apologetic voice. What do you want? I don't want anything. My shoulder aches. You're a wicked man, Daddy, and God will punish you. You'll see, he will punish you. My darling, I know your shoulder aches, but what can I do, dearie? 
said the man, in the tone in which men who have been drinking excuse themselves to their stern spouses. It's the journey has made your shoulder ache, Sasha. Tomorrow we shall get there and rest, and the pain will go away. Tomorrow, tomorrow, every day you say tomorrow, we shall be going on another twenty days. But we shall arrive tomorrow, dearie, on your father's word of honour. I never tell a lie, but if we are detained by the snowstorm, it is not my fault. I can't bear any more. I can't. I can't. Sasha jerked her leg abruptly and filled the room with an unpleasant wailing. Her father made a despairing gesture and looked hopelessly towards the young lady. The latter shrugged her shoulders and hesitatingly went up to Sasha. Listen, my dear, she said. It is no use crying. It's really naughty. If your shoulder aches, it can't be helped. You see, madam, said the man quickly, as though defending himself, we have not slept for two nights and have been travelling in a revolting conveyance. Well, of course, it is natural she should be ill and miserable. And then, you know, we had a drunken driver. Our portmanteau has been stolen. The snowstorm all the time. But what's the use of crying, madam? I am exhausted, though, by sleeping in a sitting position, and I feel as though I were drunk. Oh, dear, Sasha, and I feel sick as it is, and then you cry. The man shook his head, and with a gesture of despair sat down. Of course you mustn't cry, said the young lady. It's only little babies cry. If you are ill, dear, you must undress and go to sleep. Let us take off your things. When the child had been undressed and pacified, a silence reigned again. The young lady seated herself at the window and looked round wonderingly at the room of the inn, at the icon, at the stove. Apparently the room and the little girl with the thick nose in her short boy's nightgown and the child's father all seemed strange to her. This strange man was sitting in a corner. He kept looking about him helplessly as though he were drunk and rubbing his face with the palm of his hand. He sat silent, blinking, and judging from his guilty-looking figure, it was difficult to imagine that he would soon begin to speak. Yet, he was the first to begin. Stroking his knees, he gave a cough, laughed, and said, It's a comedy, it really is. I look, and I cannot believe my eyes. For what devilry has destiny driven us to this accursed inn? What did she want to show by it? Life sometimes performs such salto mortal. One can only stare and blink in amazement. Have you come from far, madam? No, not from far, answered the young lady. I am going from our estate, fifteen miles from here, to our farm, to my father and brother. My name is Ilovaisky, and the farm is called Ilovaisko. It's nine miles away. What unpleasant weather. It couldn't be worse. The lame boy came in and stuck a new candle in the pomatum pot. You might bring us the samovar, boy, said the man, addressing him. Who drinks tea now? laughed the boy. It is a sin to drink tea before mass. Never mind, boy. You won't burn in hell if we do. Over the tea, the new acquaintances got into conversation. Emazel Ilovaisky learned that her companion was called Grigory Petrovich Liharev that he was the brother of the Liharev, who was marshal of nobility in one of the neighbouring districts, and he himself had once been a landowner, but had run through everything in his time. Liharev learned that her name was Maria Mihailovna, that her father had a huge estate, but that she was the only one to look after it, as her father and brother looked at life through their fingers, were irresponsible and were too fond of Harriers. My father and brother are all alone at the farm, she told him, brandishing her fingers. She had the habit of moving her fingers before her pointed face as she talked, and after every sentence moistened her lips with her sharp little tongue. They, I mean men, are an irresponsible lot, and don't stir a finger for themselves. I can fancy there will be no one to give them a meal after the fast. We have no mother and we have such servants that they can't lay the tablecloth properly when I am away. You can imagine their condition now. They will be left with nothing to break their fast, while I have to stay here all night. How strange it all is. She shrugged her shoulders, 
took a sip from her cup and said, There are festivals that have a special fragrance. At Easter, Trinity and Christmas, there is a peculiar scent in the air. Even unbelievers are fond of those festivals. My brother, for instance, argues that there is no God, but he is the first to hurry to Martins at Easter. Liharev raised his eyes to MLL, Ilovesky, and laughed. They argue that there is no God, she went on, laughing too. But why is it, tell me, all the celebrated writers, the learned men, clever people generally, in fact, believe towards the end of their life? If a man does not know how to believe when he is young, madam, he won't believe in his old age if he is ever so much of a writer. Judging from Liharev's cough, he had a bass voice, but probably from being afraid to speak aloud, or from exaggerated shyness, he spoke in a tenor. After a brief pause, he heaved a sign and said, The way I look at it is that faith is a faculty of the spirit. It is just the same as a talent. One must be born with it. So far as I can judge by myself, by the people I have seen in my time, and by all that is done around us, this faculty is present in Russians in its highest degree. Russian life presents us with an uninterrupted succession of convictions and aspirations, and if you care to know, it is not yet the faintest notion of lack of faith or scepticism. If a Russian does not believe in God, it means he believes in something else. Liharev took a cup of tea from MLL. Ilovaisky drank off half in one gulp and went on. I will tell you about myself. Nature has implanted in my breast an extraordinary faculty for belief. Whisper it not to the night, but half my life I was in the ranks of the atheists and nihilists, but there was not one hour in my life in which I ceased to believe. All talents, as a rule, show themselves in early childhood, and so my faculty showed itself when I could still walk upright under the table. My mother liked her children to eat a great deal, and when she gave me food, she used to say, Eat! Soup is the great thing in life. I believed, and ate the soup ten times a day, ate like a shark, ate till I was disgusted and stupefied. My nurse used to tell me fairy tales, and I believed in house spirits, in wood elves, and in goblins of all kinds. I used sometimes to steal corrosive sublimate from my father, sprinkle it on cakes, and carry them up to the attic that the house spirits, you see, might eat them and be killed. And when I was taught to read and understand what I read, then there was a fine to do. I ran away to America and went off to join the brigands and wanted to go into a monastery and hired boys to torture me for being a Christian. And note that my faith was always active, never dead, if I was. Running away to America, I was not alone but seduced someone else, as great a fool as I was, to go with me, and was delighted when I was nearly frozen outside the town gates and when I was thrashed. If I went to join the brigands, I always came back with my face battered. A most restless childhood, I assure you. And when they sent me to the high school and pelted me with all sorts of truths, that is, that the earth goes round the sun, or that white light is not white, but is made up of seven colours. My poor little head began to go round. Everything was thrown into a whirl in me. Navin, who made the sun stand still, and my mother, who in the name of the prophet Elijah disapproved of lightning conductors, and my father, who was indifferent to the truths I had learned. My enlightenment inspired me. I wandered about the house and stables like one possessed, preaching my truths, was horrified by ignorance glowed with hatred for anyone who saw in white light nothing but white light. But all that's nonsense and childishness. Serious, so to speak, manly enthusiasms began only at the university. You have, no doubt, madam, taken your degree somewhere. I studied at Novichokask at the Don Institute. Then you have not been to a university? So you don't know what science means. All the sciences in the world have the same passport, without which they regard themselves as meaningless, the striving towards truth. Every one of them, even pharmacology, has for its aim not utility, not the alleviation of life, but truth. It's remarkable. When you set to work to study any science, what strikes you first of all is its beginning. I assure you there is nothing more attractive and grander, nothing is so staggering, 
Nothing takes a man's breath away like the beginning of any science. From the first five or six lectures you are soaring on wings of the brightest hopes, you already seem to yourself to be welcoming truth with open arms. And I gave myself up to science, heart and soul, passionately, as to the woman one loves. I was its slave. I found it the sun of my existence and asked for no other. I studied day and night without rest, ruined myself over books, wept when before my eyes men exploited science for their own personal ends. But my enthusiasm did not last long. The trouble is that every science has a beginning but not an end, like a recurring decimal. Zoology has discovered 35,000 kinds of insects. Chemistry reckons 60 elements. If in time tens of noughts can be written after these figures, Zoology and chemistry will be just as far from their end as now, and all contemporary scientific work consists in increasing these numbers. I saw through this trick when I discovered the 35001 sit and felt no satisfaction. Well, I had no time to suffer from disillusionment, as I was soon possessed by a new faith. I plunged into nihilism with its manifestos, its black divisions, and all the rest of it. I went to the people, worked in factories, worked as an oiler, as a barge hauler. Afterwards, when wandering over Russia, I had a taste of Russian life. I turned into a fervent devotee of that life. I loved the Russian people with poignant intensity. I loved their God and believed in Him, and in their language, their creative genius, and so on, and so on. I have been a Slavophile in my time. I used to pester Aksakov with letters, and I was a Ukrainophile and an archaeologist and a collector of specimens of peasant art. I was enthusiastic over ideas, people, events, places. My enthusiasm was endless. Five years ago, I was working for the abolition of private property. My last creed was non-resistance to evil. Sasha gave an abrupt sigh and began moving. Liharev got up and went to her. Won't you have some tea, dearie? he asked tenderly. Drink it yourself, the child answered rudely. Liharev was disconcerted and went back to the table with a guilty step. Then you have had a lively time, said Mlle Ilovaisky. You have something to remember. Well, yes. It's all very lively when one sits over tea and chatters to a kind listener, but you should ask what that liveliness has cost me. What price have I paid for the variety of my life? You see, madam, I have not held my convictions like a German doctor of philosophy, zierlich menelich. I have not lived in solitude, but every conviction I have had has bound my back to the yoke, has torn my body to pieces. Judge for yourself. I was wealthy like my brothers. But now I am a beggar. In the delirium of my enthusiasm, I smashed up my own fortune and my wife's a heap of other people's money. Now I am forty-two, old age is close upon me, and I am homeless, like a dog that has dropped behind its wagon at night. All my life I have not known what peace meant. My soul has been in continual agitation, distressed even by its hopes. I have been wearied out with heavy, irregular work, have endured privation, have five times been in prison, have dragged myself across the provinces of Archangel and of Tobolsk. It's painful to think of it. I have lived, but in my fever I have not even been conscious of the process of life itself. Would you believe it? I don't remember a single spring. I never noticed how my wife loved me, how my children were born. What more can I tell you? I have been a misfortune to all who have loved me. My mother has worn mourning for me all these fifteen years, while my proud brothers, who have had to wince, to blush, to bow their heads, to waste their money on my account, have come in the end to hate me like poison. Leharev got up and sat down again. If I were simply unhappy, I should thank God, he went on, without looking at his listener. My personal unhappiness sinks into the background when I remember how often in my enthusiasms I have been absurd, far from the truth, unjust, cruel, dangerous. How often I have hated and despised those whom I ought to have loved, and vice versa. I have changed a thousand times. 
One day I believe, fall down and worship. The next I flee like a coward from the gods and friends of yesterday and swallow in silence the scoundrel they hurl after me. God alone has seen how often I have wept and bitten my pillow in shame for my enthusiasms. Never once in my life have I intentionally lied or done evil, but my conscience is not clear. I cannot even boast, madam, that I have no one's life upon my conscience, for my wife died before my eyes, worn out by my reckless activity. Yes, my wife. I tell you they have two ways of treating women nowadays. Some measure women's skulls to prove woman is inferior to man, pick out her defects to mock at her, to look original in her eyes, and to justify their sensuality. Others do their utmost to raise women to their level, that is, force them to learn by heart the 35,000 species, to speak and write the same foolish things as they speak and write themselves. Liharev's face darkened. I tell you that woman has been and always will be the slave of man, he said in a bass voice, striking his fist on the table. She is the soft, tender wax which a man always moulds into anything he likes. My God! For the sake of some trumpery masculine enthusiasm, she will cut off her hair, abandon her family, die among strangers. Among the ideas for which she has sacrificed herself, there is not a single feminine one. An unquestioning, devoted slave. I have not measured skulls, but I say this from hard, bitter experience. The proudest, most independent women, if I have succeeded in communicating to them my enthusiasm, have followed me without criticism, without question, and done anything I chose. I have turned a nun into a nihilist who, as I heard afterwards, shot a gendarme. My wife never left me for a minute in my wanderings, and like a weathercock, changed her faith in step with my changing enthusiasms. Liharev jumped up and walked up and down the room. A noble, sublime slavery, he said, clasping his hands. It is just in it that the highest meaning of woman's life lies, of all the fearful medley of thoughts and impressions accumulated in my brain from my association with women. My memory, like a filter, has retained no ideas, no clever saying, no philosophy, nothing but that extraordinary resignation to fate that wonderful mercifulness, forgiveness of everything. Liharev clenched his fists, stared at a fixed point, and with a sort of passionate intensity, as though he were savouring each word as he uttered it, hissed through his clenched teeth. That, that great-hearted fortitude, faithfulness unto death, poetry of the heart, the meaning of life lies in just that unrepining martyrdom, in the tears which would soften a stone, in the boundless, all-forgiving love which brings light and warmth into the chaos of life. Mademoiselle Ilovaisky got up slowly, took a step towards Liharev, and fixed her eyes upon his face. From the tears that glittered on his eyelashes, from his quivering, passionate voice, from the flush on his cheeks, it was clear to her that women were not a chance not a simple subject of conversation. They were the object of his new enthusiasm, or, as he said himself, his new faith. For the first time in her life, she saw a man carried away, fervently believing. With his gesticulations, with his flashing eyes, he seemed to her mad, frantic, but there was a feeling of such beauty in the fire of his eyes, in his words, in all the movements of his huge body, that without noticing what she was doing, she stood facing him as though rooted to the spot and gazed into his face with delight. Take my mother, he said, stretching out his hand to her with an imploring expression on his face. I poisoned her existence. According to her ideas, disgraced the name of Leharev, did her as much harm as the most malignant enemy. And what do you think? My brothers give her little sums for holy bread and church services and outraging her religious feelings. She saves that money and sends it in secret to her erring Grigory. This trifle alone elevates and ennobles the soul far more than all the theories, all the clever sayings and the 35,000 species. I can give you thousands of instances. 
take you even, for instance. With tempest and darkness outside, you're going to your father and your brother to cheer them with your affection in the holiday, though very likely they have forgotten and are not thinking of you. And wait a bit, and you will love a man and follow him to the North Pole. You would, wouldn't you? Yes, if I loved him. There, you see, cried Liharev, delighted, and he even stamped with his foot. Oh, dear, how glad I am that I have met you. Fate is kind to me. I'm always meeting splendid people. Not a day passes, but one makes acquaintance with somebody one would give one's soul for. There are ever so many more good people than bad in this world. Here, see, for instance, how openly and from our hearts we have been talking as though we had known each other a hundred years. Sometimes, I assure you, one restrains oneself for ten years and holds one's tongue, is reserved with one's friends and one's wife, and meets some cadet in a train and babbles one's whole soul out to him. It is the first time I have the honour of seeing you, and yet I have confessed to you as I have never confessed in my life. Why is it? Rubbing his hands and smiling good-humouredly, Liharev walked up and down the room and fell to talking about women again. Meanwhile, they began ringing for matins. Goodness, wailed Sasha. He won't let me sleep with his talking. Oh, yes, said Liharev, startled. I am sorry, darling. Sleep, sleep. I have two boys besides her, he whispered. They are living with their uncle, madam, but this one can't exist a day without her father. She's wretched, she complains, but she sticks to me like a fly to honey. I have been chattering too much, madam, and it would do you no harm to sleep. Wouldn't you like me to make up a bed for you? Without waiting for permission, he shook the wet police, stretched it on a bench, fur side upwards, collected various shawls and scarves, put the overcoat folded up into a roll for a pillow, and all this he did in silence with a look of devout reverence, as though he were not handling a woman's rags, but the fragments of holy vessels. There was something apologetic, embarrassed about his whole figure, as though in the presence of a weak creature he felt ashamed of his height and strength. When Mademoiselle Ilovaisky had lain down, he put out the candle and sat down on a stool by the stove. So, madam, he whispered, lighting a fat cigarette and puffing the smoke into the stove. Nature has put into the Russian an extraordinary faculty for belief, a searching intelligence, and the gift of speculation, but all that is reduced to ashes by irresponsibility, laziness, and dreamy frivolity. Yes. She gazed wonderingly into the darkness, and saw only a spot of red on the icon and the flicker of the light of the stove on Leharev's face. The darkness, the chime of the bells, the roar of the storm, the lame boy, Sasha with her fretfulness, unhappy Liharev and his sayings, all this was mingled together and seemed to grow into one huge impression, and God's world seemed to her fantastic, full of marvels and magical forces. All that she had heard was ringing in her ears, and human life presented itself to her as a beautiful poetic fairy tale without an end. The immense impression grew and grew, clouded consciousness, and turned into a sweet dream. She was asleep, though she saw the little icon lamp and a big nose with the light playing on it. She heard the sound of weeping. Daddy, darling, a child's voice was tenderly entreating. Let's go back to uncle. There is a Christmas tree there. Steopa and Kolya are there. My darling, what can I do? A man's bass persuaded softly. Understand me. Come, understand. And the man's weeping blended with the child's. This voice of human sorrow, in the midst of the howling of the storm, touched the girl's ear with such sweet human music that she could not bear the delight of it, and wept too. She was conscious afterwards of a big, black shadow coming softly up to her, picking up a shawl that had dropped onto the floor and carefully wrapping it round her feet. Emzel Ilovaisky was awakened by a strange uproar. She jumped up and looked about her in astonishment. The deep blue dawn was looking in at the window half covered with snow. In the room there was a grey twilight, 
through which the stove and the sleeping child and Nasir Eddin stood out distinctly. The stove and the lamp were both out. Through the wide open door she could see the big tavern room with a counter and chairs. A man with a stupid gypsy face and astonished eyes was standing in the middle of the room in a puddle of melting snow, holding a big red star on a stick. He was surrounded by a group of boys, motionless as statues and plastered over with snow. The light shone through the red paper of the star, throwing a glow of red on their wet faces. The crowd was shouting in disorder, and from its uproar, M.L. lay. Ilovaisky could make out only one couplet. Liharev was standing near the counter, looking feelingly at the singers and tapping his feet in time. Seeing Emele Ilovaisky, he smiled all over his face and came up to her. She smiled too. A happy Christmas, he said. I saw you slept well. She looked at him, said nothing, and went on smiling. After the conversation in the night, he seemed to her not tall and broad-shouldered, but little, just as the biggest steamer seems to us a little thing when we hear that it has crossed the ocean. Well, it is time for me to set off, she said. I must put on my things. Tell me where you're going now. I? To the station of Klinushki, from there to Sergievo, and from Sergievo, with horses, thirty miles to the coal mines that belong to a horrid man, a general called Shashkovsky. My brothers have got me the post of superintendent there. I am going to be a coal miner. Stay, I know those mines. Shashkovsky is my uncle, you know. But what are you going there for? asked Emazel Ilovaisky, looking at Liharev in surprise. As superintendent, to superintend the coal mines. I don't understand, she shrugged her shoulders. You are going to the mines. But you know, it's the bare steppe, a desert, so dreary that you couldn't exist a day there. It's horrible coal, no one will buy it, and my uncle's a maniac, a despot, a bankrupt. You won't get your salary. No matter, said Laharev unconcernedly, I am thankful even for coal mines. She shrugged her shoulders and walked about the room in agitation. I don't understand, I don't understand, she said moving her fingers before her face. It's impossible and, and irrational. You must understand that it's, it's worse than exile. It is a living tomb. Oh, heavens, she said hotly, going up to Liharev and moving her fingers before his smiling face. Her upper lip was quivering and her sharp face turned pale. Come, picture it, the bare step, solitude. There is no one to say a word to there, and you are enthusiastic over women, coal mines, and women. M. Izel Ilovaisky was suddenly ashamed of her heat, and turning away from Liharev, walked to the window. No, no, you can't go there, she said, moving her fingers rapidly over the pane. Not only in her heart, but even in her spine she felt that behind her stood an infinitely unhappy man, lost and outcast, while he, as though he were unaware of his unhappiness, as though he had not shed tears in the night, was looking at her with a kindly smile. Better, he should go on weeping. She walked up and down the room several times in agitation, then stopped short in a corner and sank into thought. Liharev was saying something, but she did not hear him. Turning her back on him, she took out of her purse a money note, stood for a long time crumpling it in her hand, and looking round at Leharev, blushed and put it in her pocket. The coachman's voice was heard through the door. With a stern, concentrated face, she began putting on her things in silence. Leharev wrapped her up, chatting gaily, but every word he said lay on her heart like a weight. It is not cheering to hear the unhappy or the dying jest. When the transformation of a live person into a shapeless bundle had been completed, Mimzeli, Ilovaisky looked for the last time round the traveller's room, stood a moment in silence, and slowly walked out. Liharev went to see her off. Outside, God alone knows why, the winter was raging still. Whole clouds of big soft snowflakes were whirling restlessly over the earth, unable to find a resting place. The horses, the sledge, the trees, a bull tied to a post, 
all were white and seemed soft and fluffy. Well, God help you, muttered Leharev, tucking her into the sledge. Don't remember evil against me. She was silent. When the sledge started and had to go round a huge snowdrift, she looked back at Leharev with an expression as though she wanted to say something to him. He ran up to her, but she did not say a word to him. She only looked at him through her long eyelashes with little specks of snow on them. Whether his finely intuitive soul were really able to read that look, or whether his imagination deceived him, it suddenly began to seem to him that with another touch or two that girl would have forgiven him his failures, his age, his desolate position, and would have followed him without question or reasonings. He stood a long while as though rooted to the spot, gazing at the tracks left by the sledge runners. The snowflakes greedily settled on his hair, his beard, his shoulders. Soon the track of the runners had vanished, and he himself, covered with snow, began to look like a white rock, but still his eyes kept seeking something in the clouds of snow.